The Eagle and Child, Episode 32. Mere Christianity, Book 4, Chapter 4. The Good Infection. Hello, and welcome to The Eagle and Child, the hallowed pub of the Inklings. This is a podcast where each week, my friend Matt and I share a beer and we discuss the writings of the author known to the world as Clive Staples Lewis, or C.S. Lewis, or just as Jack to his friends. My name is David, and in today's episode, we're going to really dive into the transforming life of the Trinity. As always, I'm joined by Matt, a man who has transformed my life. But whether it's for good or for ill, only time will tell. I think we can honestly say it's a little both. (laughs) Seriously. And I take pride in that. I'm glad that you admit that you haven't been a thoroughly good influence on me. And that's a good thing. How so? I don't know. I think maybe you're too good. That that is my problem. I'm just too good. <laughs> yeah. I like to feel like I round you out a little bit in both the good and the bad ways. Okay. Take a little pride in that. Okay. All right. You're, you're entitled to your opinion. It is interesting, though. A friend of mine who I lived with for a few months was in San Diego this past weekend. He's from South Carolina. And he, when I lived with him, he figured out in the first week of living with him that I'm a bulldozer. And he appreciated it. But he goes, you just, your personality bulldozes. You, you, I'm not ashamed of, okay, this is who I am, and I'm just going to let you know it. And he said it had a good effect on him. I'm like, perfect. <laughs> so you can call me the bulldozer. I'm, I'm glad somebody appreciates you like that. <laughs> I can say, though, with confidence that you've trans- my, transformed my life for the better. Thank you. It's what I, it's what I do. Just make everybody better. And then I'm leaving you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, listeners. We are very sad. Well, I'm sad to announce that Matt is trying to break up the dynamic duo. He is moving to New York. And, I mean, can you have a Batman without a Robin or a brain without a pinky? Well, we're about to find out. But we are actually going to be carrying on this podcast. Uh, This means that I have to learn how to do this remotely over Skype. (laughs) And it also means every time you hear us cheersing our drinks, it's going to be fake. (laughs) (laughs) Or I've got to just find a way of virtually cheersing. Good luck with that. I bet with artificial intelligence, it could detect that you're pushing forward towards the camera and make a clink sound. Yeah, just your recognition. Yeah, there you go. But turning to the chapter, I would argue this is one of the most important chapters of mere Christianity, at least to date. As we go through it, maybe another one is going (laughs) to come across that way. So this is going to be like every other chapter. Matt's saying, this is my favorite chapter. It might be because this all builds around the Trinity, which is an incredibly important topic and a difficult one. Mm Mm-hmm. But this chapter answers the questions, what does Christianity offer? Is it just making you a better person? What's the point of surrendering yourself to Christianity? That's a big question. And I think this chapter answers it really beautifully. And second, I would also argue that answer somewhat leads to another question. Why is it the greatest gift ever? Like, why should you be excited for Christianity? Why should you want to not only surrender your life to it, but give it to everybody else. And this chapter is going to answer that. And you just have to listen for 25 minutes and we offer those answers. Seems like a pretty good deal to me. Bargain. It's a bargain. So what's our quote for the week? It's a bit longer one because I wanted it to connect with the Trinity. It's from The Problem of Pain. So I'm going to read this slowly. In self-giving, if anywhere, we touch a rhythm not only of all creation but of all being. For the eternal word also gives himself in sacrifice. And not only on Calvary, from the foundation of the world, he surrenders begotten deity back to begetting deity in obedience. From the highest to the lowest, self exists to be abdicated. And by that abdication becomes more truly self to be thereupon yet the more abdicated and so forever. Wow. What what does that make you think? (laughs) Listeners probably like, I didn't get half of that. So David, what do you summarize it? They they can go back and listen to that a few more times. Uh, To me, it speaks about how the son gives himself back to the father, both in that case and for ourselves. When we give ourselves to God, the more we give ourselves away to God, the more we get ourselves back and our true self back. In the same way that... In the liturgy, we bring forth bread and wine, and we get back from that altar something so much better. 
That fits perfectly with what we're going to talk about. It's almost as if you're ready. <laughs> it's almost as if I read the chapter beforehand. <laughs> so what are we drinking? So today, because Matt's leaving and David's moving, we're out of materials <laughs> and equipment and stuff. So we just have some gin with absolutely nothing in it. <laughs> and, we, and rather than proper glasses, we are using a Chinese tea set that I have. Cheers. 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 Oh! <laughs> you got to keep that. David just spilled on my computer. It's not much. I guess we'll get it off. It's gone. The next person uses your laptop is like, what is your laptop smell of gin? No, I won't spill it. Okay, let's uh, let's let's do let's, this. Let's try to pretend let's do you're going to put it Let's do this again, and hopefully you don't spill on the equipment. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Gin without tonic is not the best. Oh, I don't know. I quite like it. We're, and we're drinking Bombay Sapphire, which is a pretty good quality gin. Well done, Matt. Lewis begins this chapter with a thought experiment. Just as a warning, this first, maybe third of it, we're going to get into some deeper theology, trying to explain the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. Bear with us. Even if you don't understand what we're talking about, because it'll just be applied to talking about the Christian journey, our journey and our participation in the divine life, and some incredible theology will, will come from it. So just bear with us. Lewis begins this chapter with a thought experiment. He says, imagine two books lying on a table, one on top of the other. It is because of the underneath book that the top one is resting, say, two inches from the surface of the table, instead of touching the table. Let us call the underneath book A and the top one B. The position of A is causing the position of B. Okay, so you got that? Yes, yeah, so we've got two books, A and B. A is on the bottom, so A is holding B up. Almost seems like A is causing B to be where it is. Yep. So Lewis then goes on. He says, let us imagine that both books have been in that position forever and ever. In that case, B's position would always be resulting from A's position. But all the same, A's position would not have existed before B's position. In other words, the result does not come after the cause. And that is interesting. He talks a lot about in this chapter cause and effect. And I never thought about that. You always assume the effect is after the cause. But you can't genuinely have a cause without an effect. Mm -hmm. You can't have book B on top of A without A under B. Like positionally, they both have their characteristics because of the other. So A's role in causing B is only there because B is there too. And Lewis is giving us this thought experiment to help us understand an aspect of the Trinity. Yeah, the listeners are probably like, where is all this going? <laughs> because in particular, he says that when we speak about the Trinity, it can make it sound like some persons of the Trinity existed before others, particularly when we speak about the Father begetting the Son. But part of the problem is, is that we forget what begetting really means. As Jack explains, the father begetting the son is explaining the core truth that they are the same sort of thing. He says, the first person is called the father and the second is the son. We say that the first begets or produces the second. We call it begetting, not making, because what he produces is of the same kind as himself. In that way, the word father is the only word to use. And we talked about this before in a previous episode. Mm-hmm begetting and making. So just a quick reminder to individuals, a mother begets a son. But if we were to create a sculpture as a person, that's creating something. It's of a different material. It could re We could create a sculpture of a human and it resembles us. It looks like us, but that's not begotten. It's made of different stuff. Exactly. So it's the same thing. When God begets the son, it's made of the same material. We weren't begotten. We were made. So two very different things. So it makes sense to use the language father begetting a son. But the difficulty with this is it suggests that the father existed before the son. But here's what Lewis says. That's not so. And there's no before and after about it. And that's why I've spent some time trying to make clear how one thing can be the source or the cause or the origin of another without being there before it. So God can be the cause, the father of the son, but he wasn't there before it. The son exists because the father exists, but there never was a time before the father produced the son. Think back to the books. A is holding B up. 
but there was never a time before A holding B. Their position will happen at the exact same point in time. The cause and effect happen at the exact same point in time. And to try and explain this, Lewis then returns to the thought experiment, and he points something out. He says, when I asked you to imagine these books, you probably did, and you probably therefore had a picture of these books in your head. So the act of imagination is definitely the cause, and the result is this mental picture. But he says that that doesn't mean that you first did the imagining and then got the picture. The moment you did it, the picture was there, and it was sustained there by your will. And he goes on and says, imagine then that there was a being who had always existed and had always been imagining one thing. His act would have always been producing that mental picture, but the picture would be just as eternal as the act. Here he's talking about the father and the son, the father eternally begetting the son. You feel like your mind's going to be blown when you die and get to heaven? (laughs) Well, if St. Paul is right and... What's in store for us is something that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can conceive what God has in store, then sure, I'm okay with having my mind blown. And as, as we go through this, we have to remember this is meant to help us get closer to an incredibly difficult thing to understand. We are temporal creatures. We, we experience life moment by moment. We experience it within time. And we're somehow trying to talk about a timeless, immaterial, eternal thing. And so it's important to remember that. And it's also important, Lewis is trying to explain all this by using temporal stuff to help us understand it. He could also have taken a different approach and took a timeless approach and said, well, it's outside of time, so it it can be done that way also. Throughout this book, Lewis offers us analogies to help us understand things. But analogies always have their limits. There comes a point when the analogy actually breaks down. And Lewis says that hopefully... This thought experiment will help you understand the Trinity a little better. But we've got to be careful with these kinds of images because it can make it sound like the Father and the Son are two different things rather than just two different persons. And he says that probably we're safer if we stay closer to the language of sacred scripture. After all, this is God's revelation of himself, so he will probably describe himself far better than we can. But he says we don't actually even have to necessarily exclusively use scriptural language. He says we can go away for a moment in order to make a particular point clear, but we've always got to go back. He says this, Naturally, God knows how to describe himself much better than we know how to describe him. He knows that father and son is more like the relation between the first and second persons than anything else we can think of. Much the most important thing is to know that it is a relation of love. The father delights in the son, and the son looks up to his father. With this foundation in mind of the father beginning the son, but being both present at the same time, not one coming after the other, Lewis changes gears to consider this statement we hear all the time. God is love. If the father had actually come before the son, that would mean there was a period when the father existed, the son didn't. That statement has no meaning because we know love is always in relation to another person. At least two people. At least two people. So if there was ever a point in existence, just the Father, and there was no Son, there was no Holy Spirit, there's no Trinity, love doesn't work. You can't say God is love. And this is one of the most fundamental, crucial, life-transforming truths about God. I've heard Muslims say that Allah is, is loving, but that doesn't quite work. And you certainly can't say God is love if you're talking about the God of the Quran. Because there's no room for a trinity in Islamic theology. Both Christians and Muslims are monotheists. We believe that there is only one God. But Christians are Trinitarians, whereas Muslims are Unitarians. They believe in a very strict oneness of God. In Islamic theology, it's called Tawheed. But Lewis has pointed out a problem. You can't say God is love when there is only one person. And in Islam, Allah is alone. Whereas in Christianity, God is a community of persons. Lewis says, we believe in a living, dynamic activity of love that has been going on in God forever and has created everything else. Even before God made man, God was in a relationship of love. In fact, we'd even go so far as to say that God created man in order for man to share in this already existing bond of love between the persons of the Trinity. 
And I remember Lewis in the chapter describing it. I like how he said, don't think of me as irreverent here, but you can think of it as a kind of dance between the three. What a beautiful mental image. Particularly since both of us are dancers. I know this is one of the best images ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think of, I think of the, the beautiful song by Bethel Music, We Dance. If you, if you listen to it, it's just you picture yourself dancing with Jesus. And now I picture myself dancing with the Trinity. Imagine being caught up and wrapped up in the love between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I was actually commenting years ago on uh, a Catholic's blog. He was talking about bad analogies for the Trinity. And I said, one of my favorites is that of a dance. And the author responded, says, but I only count two people in that dance. I said, you're forgetting the music. Because it's the thing that, that binds the two dancers together, unites them in a unity, and propels them across the dance floor. Like every analogy, it, it has its limits, but it's one I really, really like. Well, what a perfect transition, though, because we've only spoken about the Father and the Son. We haven't actually spoken about the third person, the Holy Spirit. And this is what Lewis says about it. The union between the Father and the Son is such a live, concrete thing that this union itself is also a person. And he, he recognizes that might be hard to understand. How is this union between two so tangible that it creates this other being? But he's, he uses an analogy, as always. And he goes, think of those times where a few people gather together, maybe two friends, three friends that are so close, this community that comes together. And you describe it that there's a spirit to it. Mm-hmm. Something about them coming together brings out the spirit that would never have happened if the two were separate. Well, again, it's imperfect. It lets you understand what happens with the Holy Spirit. And Scott Hahn loves comparing the Trinity to a family, an earthly family, a husband and a wife, where they each pour their love into the other. And he says, nine months later, their love between them can become so strong, so concrete, that they have to give this love a name. That in a similar way, the way that a child is, is the fruit of the love between spouses, the Holy Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son. I'd probably say that's a better analogy than Lewis's. Mm. Honestly, that, that. <laughs> it's definitely more vivid. It's something that we, it's easier to grasp. It's easier to grasp. That's the better way. It's very tangible. Mm-hmm. Because we're used to seeing husbands, wives, and children. <laughs> yes. And not everyone has hit the salsa clubs with us, so they, they can't fully grasp the beauty of our dance. Okay, not that we dance together, we dance separately. <laughs> yeah, let's be clear about this. <laughs> and also, I'm swing. I don't know anything about salsa. Uh, I can swing as well. Well, you're just a good dancer in general. Thank you. I do want to learn a salsa dance, though. Very important. I need another spirit to be I did, I did it. I did it for about six months before I discovered I had hips. <laughs> it took you that long? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm English. I didn't think Englishmen actually had hips. There was one thing that Lewis said about the Holy Spirit that did make me chuckle. He said that we shouldn't be worried or surprised if we find the Holy Spirit rather vague or shadowy in comparison to the Father and the Son. I mean, would you say that's true in your life, in your spiritual journey? Did you find the Holy Spirit a a little vaguer, a little hard to get to grips with? I would say I didn't actually think about it much. Until, yeah, it wasn't until after college that I started thinking about it. So I would just, I wouldn't say it was vaguer. I just, my faith was in relation to the Father and the Son, never gave much thought to the Holy Spirit. But I would say is my my theology is developed without even understanding the concept of what we just talked about with the Holy Spirit. I, I started calling the Holy Spirit in my life more. I love Father Hesburg from Notre Dame. Always one of his favorite prayers is come a Holy Spirit. And so I've started praying to the Holy Spirit much more. I've started seeing in scripture, the role of the Holy Spirit much more guiding people. When you understand Pentecost and the Holy Spirit coming on people. So I guess I've just believed in the Holy Spirit without really understanding it. I've just accepted it, is maybe what I'm trying to say. Hmm. But I've never thought much of it until recently. See, in my journey, I very clearly went through each person of the Trinity. When I was a child, I, I primarily thought of God as Father. And so I prayed to the Father. Then when I had my spiritual awakening at university, I discovered the person of Jesus. And it was only about the time after I was leaving university 
particularly when I was hanging out with some Pentecostals, that the Holy Spirit started to come front and center as well. But yeah, he was kind of the forgotten person of the Trinity, at least, you know, what's interesting? <laughs> at least in my theology for a long time. What's interesting, though, is that was my progression, too. Uh, it, it, the Holy Spirit came, was the last of them to come. But I'm intrigued because it only comes when you're, at least in our both of our circumstances, if we've gotten much deeper in our faith. So what does that say about the Holy Spirit? Does that say it's vaguer, or does that say it's it's another depth? Like that's is it is it a progression where the Father is the easiest, Jesus is next, and the Holy Spirit is that just a coincidence that you and I went that way? Or is it that or it's only as you tend to advance in your faith that you tend to notice the activity of the Spirit? That He was always there, He was always working, but you just never noticed. And Lewis actually says something similar. He says, in the Christian life, you're not usually looking at Him; He is always acting through you. If you think of the Father as something out there in front of you and the Son as someone standing at your side, helping you pray, trying to turn you into another Son, then you have to think of the third person as something inside of you or behind you. And if someone's inside or behind you, you can tend to miss them. (laughs) So we began with talking about the Father and the Son and using the analogy of the books to explain that while the Father begot the Son... They've been in existence for eternity. Then we brought in the Holy Spirit, which was the spirit of the union between the Father and the Son. But same way, it was, they've all three been present, well, three persons, one being in eternity. There was no one came first and the second and the third. And this was important for love and understanding the love between them and the dynamic pulsating dance between them. So what does this mean for us now? What does this mean for Christianity? Well, Lewis says, Each one of us has got to enter that pattern. Take his place in that dance. There's no other way to happiness for which we were made. And there's no other point to Christ, to Christianity. Everything, when you boil it down, its purpose is to be drawn up into the Trinity. And who would, if I were to have asked a random person on the street, what is Christianity? How many people would say it's to participate in the divine dance, the eternal dance and life of the Trinity. Who would answer it that way? Very few. Uh, Very few. But that is the true answer. What's the point of Christianity? Well, for your sins be forgiven. That's a true statement. Mm -hmm. But that's not everything. It's, It's not the end game. It's not the end game. It is the means by which we actually enter into the life of the Trinity. We actually had Joe Heschmeyer come to the Bible study at the Immaculata. He gave a talk on theosis. Real quick, who's Joe Heschmeyer? Joe, he's a Catholic blogger, he's also a podcaster, phenomenal writer. But he spoke to us about theosis, and it's it's all focused around this, the idea of being drawn up into the life of the Trinity, that this is how we should really understand Christianity. And this is why, I said in the beginning, this is the greatest gift. Why I should be excited to share this with everyone, why you should be excited, why we all should be. Right here, no other way to happiness. But it then begs the question, how do we enter into this Trinitarian love? Yes. And Lewis says that, well, we receive these divine gifts by proximity. He says, good as well as bad things are caught by a kind of infection. That's the title of this chapter, good infection. This is a good version of that. Yeah, he says, if you want to get warm, you've got to stand near a fire. If you want to be wet, you jump into some water. And so he says, likewise, if you want joy, power, peace, eternal life, you must get close to or even into the thing that has them. These aren't prizes that God hands out to good little boys and girls. This is, he calls it the great fountain of energy and beauty spurting forth from the very center of reality. And he says, if you get close to it, the spray will wet you. And if not, you'll remain dry. And he asks this question. Once a man is united to God, how could he not live forever? And likewise, once a man is separated from God, What can he do but wither and die? So there is a role in us in constantly coming to God. So I think of we're saved by grace. It's a grace that we can even receive this Trinitarian love. It's a grace that Jesus begotten came into this world and allowed us to be called up into this Trinitarian love. But that doesn't just mean we say, yes, I want it. We need to go to it every single day. We need to become obedient to that. We need to spend time with God, not because we're trying to earn anything, but because we want to be around it. We want it to be contagious, to affect us, to, to permeate through our being so we can experience it. The more times we spend in prayer, 
church, whatever it is, scripture, it permeates into us. Well, if you remember in book three, Lewis gave us a non-exhaustive list of three things, faith, baptism, Holy Communion. Yes. This is how we receive the divine life. That's how we get caught in the spray, so to speak. And this ties back to the previous chapter, the difference between bios life, our natural life, yes. and zoe, supernatural life. This is how we receive it. The closing words of the chapter are phenomenal. So we're going to quote them in full. Now the whole offer which Christianity makes is this, that we can, if we let God have his way, come to share in the life of Christ. If we do, we shall then be sharing a life which was begotten, not made, which always has existed and always will exist. Christ is the Son of God. If we share in this kind of life, we also shall be sons of God. We shall love the Father as he does, and the Holy Ghost will rise in us. He came to this world and became a man in order to spread to other men the kind of life he has by what I call good infection. Every Christian is to become a little Christ. The whole purpose of becoming a Christian is simply nothing else. So, there you go, everyone. That's the Trinity. Everyone got it? <laughs> that simple. <laughs> no big deal. The way my brain works, guys, I think, think this way more than girls do. We need to fix it. And so I want solutions. So I recognize, well, I'm broken in this way. I'm, I'm faulty in this way. And then I think, well, I need to will myself to be better. Now I actually don't think that way as much. When I feel that there's something I'm working on that's keeping me from loving the world or living out of my true self or being my true identity in Christ, I think of the Trinity coming into me and transforming me from the inside out. It becomes a very different thought process. But it's even more than that as well, because it's not that you're just being fixed. It's you're being elevated and transformed to something far beyond what you could ever possibly achieve. It's exciting. Uh, I think it was George MacDonald. He has this example. He talks about God comes and moves into your house and he starts fixing a few walls and uh, the place is looking nicer. But then he starts knocking through walls and putting on an extra wing and doing all of this other crazy stuff. And you realize that he's not just fixing up a home. He's building a palace so that he can live there permanently. Oh, that's a great analogy. And doesn't that get you excited? Yeah. I want to be a palace. Yeah. I mean, when we've been, we're doing the video series and we talk about the great adventure mm -hmm. of Christianity. This is what we mean. The great adventure. As we participate in this, I'm just excited that I have no idea how God's going to transform me over the next 20 years. But Matt at 47 years old is going to be very different than Matt at 27 years old. And I'm not trying to say that's the point of this, but that's an adventure in its own right. To be excited to know the way that God's going to transform your life. To be able to experience him authentically, his love. To be able to live from that authenticity and love the world. And what's that going to mean? I mean, I'm excited for that. Even though I've got all this brokenness and his wounds that prevents me from experiencing joy and happiness and whatever, these fears, I know that they're going to be slowly washed away. And you're not just going to be a better you. You're going to be a transformed you. Yes. Because as St. Athanasius said, and as Lewis quotes, God became man so that man could become God. That we get drawn up into the life of the Trinity and stay there for all eternity. I think we end with that. Well, I'm going to end with a quick iTunes review because we always encourage people to write iTunes reviews for us and rate us. Helps more people find us. So the podcast that I've been listening to this week is unbelievable. It's a podcast from the UK. Here's what I wrote. If you're looking for high quality podcasts about religion, this is the podcast for you. Each week, a Christian and a non-Christian meet to discuss and debate some aspect of the faith. The host, Justin Briley, does a stellar job at remaining impartial, moderating the discussion to allow both sides to present their case. Speaking of which, I had a friend tell me he was trying to write an iTunes review and it didn't work again. Clearly there's some sort of glitch going on. Let's just assume we would have doubled the reviews if it worked. Triple. <laughs> Triple. <laughs> but anyways, we do ask that you keep sending us messages on Twitter and Instagram. That's at Pints with Jack again. And until next time, when we will be doing this over the internet, <laughs> further up. And further in. Cheers. Cheers.